thank you very much to the organizers for having this event. Um, from the New England Complex System Institute, we are located in Cambridge, Massachusetts, just like the previous speaker. And by coincidence, I'm also Venezuelan, so this is uh, very funny. So we are go I'm going to talk about a intervention strategy to cope with the Zika epidemic and what should be the collective response and the community action to stop this, uh, the propagation of this disease. So I'm just going to go fast in the first part. This is a review of how the Zika is transmitted from one person to another. We know that it's uh, transmitted by the Aedes aegypti mosquito, specifically the female, during its reproduction. And it, it, well, the mosquito bites a sick person, then flies to a healthy person and gets the healthy person sick as well. So it's the mosquito that transmits the disease from one person to another. And after beating the person, it goes and looks for a small container of stagnated water that are usually in or around houses to deposit uh, her eggs. It usually deposits around 100 eggs and it can deposit even five times during a lifetime. Once the eggs are deposited in the water, it spends a couple of days in the shape of eggs before turning into a larva that, that lasts for at least a couple of four days, then to a pupa, which is the final stage, before becoming a mosquito, and then flying around the place it was born. It usually doesn't fly more than 400 to 200 meters from the place they are actually born. So that means like the radius of a one house, two house, couple of houses. So these are common places where the mosquito is um, usually breeds. It can go to flower plots or the plate of the plants or gully traps, rough gutters, drains that are stagnated, discarnated, uh, discarnated um, furniture or, or any kind of uh, containers as well as canvas sheets or plants, air conditioners or barbecues. We know that there is no treatment for this disease. Only 20% of people actually present symptoms, and these symptoms, like we learned today, are very similar to those of uh, dengue. And there are implications of this disease that are rare but important, like we've learned today, cases of microcephaly, that it's not still confirmed, uh, the relationship, or Guillain-Barre. So this is one of the first uh, strategies to intervene, which is the individual recommendations. People say to I mean, the government or, or campaigns provide information to people, asking them to avoid being outside during the peak of mosquito peak hours, apply repellent, wear pants, long sleeves, mosquito screens or mosquito nets on beds. However, these recommendations they depend on people, right, to follow them. So there are other larger scale interventions that are usually taking place, like the use of pesticides or large campaigns to look and for uh, drain stagnated water. Of course, pesticides are a bit difficult to use around houses. We know that there are ecological consequences, they have potential health issues, and more importantly, the mosquito can build as a population, can build resistance to the pesticide, making it useless. And then, of course, we need to drain also all the water. This picture is actually taken here in Recife, both of them. And the problem with draining water is that it's very difficult to get all of them. I mean, it's not, they, they need experience, they need to make sure that everything is okay. It's not easy to drain all the water. And why is this? Because with the, the actual, our cities are quite complex. I mean, and even in a single building, we heard, there can be many locations of stagnated waters that are not controlled. So. Draining all the water can be very complex. It's not a complicated problem. It's just to turn around the container. However, to get all of them, it's very complex because there are many that we cannot even see, that we cannot even reach. So an option, rather than trying to get all of those locations, is to compete with those locations that we cannot control. And how do we compete with them? By setting traps. And these traps are called Ovi traps. They are based in provide, a location very comfortable, very nice for the mosquito to come and lay their eggs and then destroy the eggs uh, by ourselves. So this strategy is based on competing with those locations of examinated waters that we cannot control and the idea is to be able to reduce the probability of reproduction, of successful reproduction, because part of the breeding is going to take place in the, in the locations that we are controlling, and by, 
and by reducing this probability, we can also be able to, to reduce the population or even to collapse the population. Okay, so this is how traps work. You have the, for, in order to build the traps, you only need a con some containers. Plastic containers are fine. They don't have to be new containers. They can be used containers, discard containers. And the water has not, uh, doesn't have to be clean water either. It could be used water and dirty water, and it's going to work just fine. So the way of doing it is you set up the traps, you, you, provide a loca you, you can provide a leaf or a branch or a piece of clothing to facilitate. <laughs> and the mosquito will go to the trap, will lay the eggs, and you will destroy them. How would you destroy them? The strategy is to drain the water, but before draining the water, be sure that the eggs are dead. So to, in order to be sure that the eggs are dead, you can use either liquid soap or powder soap or also chloride, or other kind of products. And However, okay, okay, we're almost there, I mean. So like I said, the idea is to compete with designated water. We could use any container. Clean water is not needed. The idea is to facilitate landing, so it could be inviting for the mosquitoes to go and lay their eggs. And in order to destroy them, we can add liquid or powder soap, let it sit for an hour or so in order to be sure that the eggs are dead, and then drain the water. And after draining the water, reset the traps. So this uh, has had a, a high efficacy in reducing population, uh, mosquito population and density and the cases of dengue in many countries like Australia or Philippines. And this is an example of the Ovitrap. There's nothing special about it. We can do this with any kind of discarded uh, containers that we can have at home. The important part is that this will only function if we all do it. There is an important collective effect here. There has to be a collective action in order to deploy these traps for it to be effective. Otherwise, some people will do it, others won't, and if others don't, it doesn't matter if I do it because the mosquitoes can continue breathing in other houses and get me infected. So my actions are not independent from other people's action. That's why we need a collective action for this to work. And this is the point. So far we've been working and most of recommendations are given either in the large scale, the military going, using pesticides, draining water, well, how many times can they do this? Once, twice, or the individual scale, which is the individual recommendations that we trust that people actually follow. But there is one extra scale here that it's not been taken into account when we design the intervention, which is the community scale. There are community leaders. Community leaders know, I mean, and, and organizations and neighbor organizations, they know the complexity of the individuals they're dealing with. They know who's busy, who's not. They know who might take care of their things, who might not. Well, the large-scale intervention cannot see this because they have to cover a large area. And they, in order to cover a large scale, what you usually do is to simplify the task to a simple thing that you do once, twice, 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 twice. But this cannot manage with the individual complexities and the individual uh, diversity that it's needed to co be coped in order to stop the disease. So this is the message of our talk. We, co we, co we provide a method called the other traps, but this needs to be done with a collective action. And by collective action, I mean multiple individuals performing actions that are reinforcing each other. So, the basis of this explanation is in the complexity and complex systems. I, don't, I, I think you've seen this, uh, this image before, it's a swarm. 
In this swarm, the birds are, behave, are not behaving independently. If they're behaving independently, they cannot make this shape. But they are not behaving coherently. They are not doing exactly the same thing. They are building relationships. They are building bondings and couplings in their behavior so they can function as a big, large system. They do this because it brings collective benefits. For instance, it distracts the predators it, it, like for, for where they go, and also because they are all like uh, correlated with each other. Once once see an obstacle or something, they can move, and everyone follows, like a, a herding behavior, which cannot be done. None of these properties can be achieved if in the behavior is just independent. So how do we translate this into setting up the traps? And what we propose is to organize teams, like I said, local teams. They could be by neighborhood, they could be by a set of houses, by streets. And these teams can, uh, they will have to develop the expertise, of course, to be able to set up the traps and help deploy people's houses around their, uh, the traps in, their, in and around their houses. These traps have to be or should be changed every day. Missing one day is not problematic, but like we saw, there is a two-week period before the mosquito gets developed, so the faster these traps are reset, the more effective they are. And for this, the, the enumerating the traps and setting the date, the last time it was changed, or any kind of information can be very helpful for this organization to, uh, to happen, right? So if we are able, to build cells, let's call it like the cells of teams and neighborhoods that are performing an action that can take care of the individual complexity, that can take care of the, the little details that large-scale interventions cannot take care of. But we can have several of these, right? All of them reinforcing each other. We can reach a large-scale effect out of an individual scale an individual behavior. And this is why I say collective action will make a difference in the large scale. And for this, it's just a matter of organizing. So it's a great opportunity. We can reduce the reproduction rate using these traps. The, by reducing it, we can confine the virus to smaller cases, where the smaller areas where efforts can be directed and be able to eliminate the vector at least in a few months or decrease, collapse its population. But like I said, for this to happen, we need to organize. This is what happens when people behave independently, when people don't talk to each other, when people don't know what others are doing. This is the virus and you get eaten by it. This is what happens when you build couplings, when you organize and you stop behaving like an individual and start behaving as a system.